Hello and welcome to Storehouse 7 Ministries with me, Chris Wickland. So today we're moving into Revelation chapter 12 and part 1. And so reading from verse 1 of Revelation 12, and this is from the NASB, and it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now here we come to a short interlude in the flow of the book of Revelation. However, I do not believe it to be some kind of flashback to the beginning of time when some of the angels and Satan rebelled against God. I believe chapter 12, although containing in part a historical recap, to be fair, is still yet representing information pertaining to the coming third woe. So, for example, in verses 12 to 17, we have Satan and his angelic horde now trapped upon the earth and how they try to pursue Israel for three and a half years to destroy them and bring persecution against the church as well. Um, the term time, times and half a time in verse 14 is the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, i.e. the second half of the seven years of Daniel's 70th week. So although chapter 12 is an interlude and summary, it is still relevant as biblical prophecy. To not see chapter 12 as biblical prophecy still to unfold renders the verses an odd footnote and thus breaks the narrative and flow. If, however, it is an interlude, a summary and a warning of what's next to transpire, then chapter 12 makes a lot more sense. This is my personal opinion on this matter, not necessarily, to be fair, what most commentators would state. Revelation 12.1 A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, before we look at what the woman represents, we need to first try and understand what the sun, moon and twelve stars represent. When one comes across something puzzling in visions in scripture, one should always ask themselves, has something like this appeared in scripture before? If it has, then we can generally use that as a key to help unlock and interpret the prophetic riddle. The answer to this riddle is found in the book of Genesis chapter 37 and comes from the story uh, of Joseph and his brothers. And this is in uh, chapter 37, verses 9 to 10. Now Joseph had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still yet another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father Jacob and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? You will note in Joseph's dream that there were 11 stars, not 12. This is because it doesn't include Joseph as all his 11 brothers are bowing down to him. So the 12 stars represents the 12 tribes of Israel from this passage in Israel, uh, in Revelation, sorry. And the sun and the moon represents the patriarch and matriarch of the 12 tribes, i.e. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel and his wife. The stars on the crown of the heavenly lady represents primarily the 12 patriarchs, but stars also denote authority and heavenly angels. It is interesting to note that in verses 3 to 4, we have a similar description of the red dragon with his crowns and how he took a third of the stars with him. Stars here being angels who rebelled against God. So again, here stars are referring to powers, authorities and angels. So both the heavenly lady and the evil uh, angelic red dragon both have power, authority and celestial authority. Now I use the term celestial as the heavenly lady has celestial bodies to represent her, i.e. the sun, moon and twelve stars, whereas the red dragon only has stars for his celestial authority and power. And the stars that the red dragon has were flung to the earth, denoting a loss of heavenly celestial authority. This in part gives us a hint why the red dragon, i.e. Satan, hates the heavenly woman so much. She is an enormous threat to his power and dominion upon the earth, because actually the power and dominion belong to the heavenly lady through Christ. If Satan can get rid of the lady, then he can have nothing on earth to stand in his way, to delegitimize his limited power and authority. This then leads us to the next question. Who is the lady? 
Now, to answer this question, we have to look right back through church history, blend it with various schools of thought to come to a balanced conclusion. The Roman Catholic view is that the Heavenly Lady is Mary, the Queen of Heaven. The Eastern Orthodox understanding is that it is both Mary, who is the personification of the nation of Israel. This is one I personally tend to favour. Uh, the Protestant version states it's Israel only and has nothing to do with Mary. The modern day messianic movement, which is Protestant in its, in its general makeup, also denies Mary any place here. However, what did the early church believe? Now, as I said, I tend to favour the Eastern Orthodox position because they tend to uh, incorporate into their understanding the historical narrative of the church as well. So, well, believe it or not, the historical church, and I'm talking like right back, maybe third century, uh, saw Mary as one of the greatest Jewish saints of the high, of the highest caliber. Why? Because she was chosen to be the Theotokos. That's a Greek word which means God bearer or mother of God. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Most modern day Protestants will not tolerate such a statement, believing it to be some kind of Catholic dogma. But actually, it isn't. The early church councils decreed Mary to be the mother of God and God bearer to combat the heretical teachings of Arianism. Arianism is the doctrine which uh, some cults today still hold dear to. This is where Christ is only the son of God, a step down from the father uh, and that he is a created being and not pre-eternal. Arianism is completely non-Trinitarian, that is to say it rejects the doctrine of the Trinity that there is one God with three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So because of this, the early church councils didn't call Mary the Christ bearer, as this would easily be perverted by those holding to Arianism. This is why the early church called her the Theotokos, the God bearer, the mother of God and not just the Christ bearer. The title God bearer and mother of God does not in any way mean that Mary created God and that she is some fourth member of the Trinity or any other nonsensical arguments that people come up with. It just simply means that she gave God her human DNA and gave birth to Jesus who is very God but now clothed in the flesh from Mary and the line of David and thus fulfilling b biblical prophecy of the Messiah pertaining to the line and dynasty of David. This, in a nutshell, is the mystery and wonder and paradox of the Incarnation. So Jesus is now forever in heaven, God in human form, of the lineage of David, because he was clothed in human flesh from Mary's womb, and she was of the line of David. Again, the early church had great respect to Mary, as they saw her as the mother also of the church, in that she gave birth to the one who would himself birth the new creation, the church, the one new man. And for those who are listening to this, some may be quite offended by such thinking, but this isn't Catholic dogma. This is historical fact. Incidentally, the early reformers such as Luther, Calvin, etc., they all hate, held to the same views of Mary. So what does this mean for modern day Protestants? It means that we need to seriously think hard about this and stop ignoring Mary as not being important to the church. Most of Protestant issues with Mary is more based on suspicion or animosity to Catholicism than it is on actual theology and church history. Also, the early church saw Mary as fulfilling the Genesis 3.15 prophecy. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between you, that's Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Again, sadly, uh, modern day Protestants don't like to acknowledge that Mary fulfills this prophecy. Mary gave birth to the seed which would destroy Satan and all his seed. This means Mary is actually a way bigger deal than we modern Protestants like to concede. Also, the argument that Mary being hardly mentioned in scripture is not an argument to diminish her importance to the church at all. In Acts 1.26, they cast lots for a 12th apostle to replace Judas. He was replaced by a guy called Matthias. He only barely gets a single verse of mention, yet in the early church writings, he was a really important guy in the early church, but you wouldn't think so from such a brief mention in the scriptures. What about all those dead people that came back to life and walked about Jerusalem in Matthew 27 verse 52? This is an astonishing miracle. We don't know any more than that single verse and what it says, yet it must have shook the people at the time to the core. I mean, I could go on and on with loads of examples, but suffice to say, Mary has always been a very important person to the church. Now, Protestants 
love the Apostle Paul. They love his writings and devote much attention to him as being very important to the church. I myself am Protestant, but not not a hardcore Protestant. Where I've looked at church history from different angles, um, I tend to be kind of more in the middle now uh, than I used to be. And so, you know, I, I've I've taken on board a lot of stuff from church history and realised I was wrong actually about a lot of things. And my my incorrect attitudes were down to prejudice and ignorance rather than understanding. So again, you know, we love the Apostle Paul, right? Because we love his writings and we devote much attention to him as being very important to the church. That's what we Protestants do. But we don't idolize him. We don't pray to him. We know that he is important. Likewise, Mary is is really one of the most important Jewish people of faith to ever have lived. To be the God bearer and mother of God is a great grace and a privilege. It doesn't mean we have to pray to her and idolize her, but it should mean we give her the respect and honor that she deserves. And this is what the church throughout all of history has done. She was honored in the early church, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and all Protestant churches during and after the Reformation, even in modern day uh, Anglo Catholic Anglican churches. It is only modern day Protestantism which refuses to give her any honor and respect, which sadly says more about us. Than church history in general. So why is all this important? Because although the lady in Revelation chapter 12 is actually the nation of Israel and that is what it represents, yet it is being personified by an individual who gave birth to the Messiah and his church. See verses 5, 13 and verse 17. Therefore the vision is about Israel but being personified by an individual woman who gave birth to Christ and his church. Therefore who else could it be but Mary? Um, For Mary is the one who gave birth to Christ and she represents the Jewish race as she is herself Jewish of the lineage of David. So Mary and the Jewish people are to be seen as one and the same thing, both each representing the other. So in conclusion to today, I tend to personally favour the view of the Eastern Orthodox Church on this matter in that Mary represents the nation of Israel and vice versa. I prefer this over the Catholic view which sees Mary as the Queen of Heaven. I feel that the Eastern Orthodox view is fairer all round to the historical understanding of Mary and the nation of Israel. And we will do more uh, for, on next week. We'll go into verse two and, and it starts to get interesting then as we start to really unpick the details of these passages. You know, what the crowns mean, what the stars mean, etc. So until next week, God bless you and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. 